Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Just to let you know, we're going to begin in one minute. We're just waiting for uh, allowing a few more people to come into the room, but we will begin promptly. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope that you're all well, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be talking in this online session about renewable desalination, which is still a niche industry, but uh, it looks like over time, very quickly, is going to become quite large and remarkable. And with us today here, we have two top experts in this, uh, in this particular topic, uh, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves uh, in a minute. Just to let you know, we are recording this session and we will send it to you and we will also send you the presentations that you're going to see. So don't worry, this will be sent to you. So first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Thomas to please uh, introduce yourself. Just unmute uh, your microphone. Hi. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Thomas Altman. Uh, I'm from Aqua Power in Dubai and I'm the VP of uh, Technology and Innovation. And uh, this is uh, certainly a, a topic which we're dealing with because we're in power generation and as well as in, in seawater desalination. So where are you joining from today, Thomas? From Dubai. From Dubai. So I'm in Madrid. Thomas is in Dubai. And last but not least, Jorge, could you introduce yourself? Yes, very good morning, Belen. Good morning, everybody here from Seville in Spain. Uh, my name is Jorge Salas. I'm Vice President for Water Business Development within Avengoa. Um, well, let's see what we have this morning to discuss about this exciting topic on, on desalination plus renewable energies. Well, I'm certainly very excited. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask Thomas to share his. And so that you know, the way that is going to work is first we're going to hear from Thomas, then we're going to hear from Jorge, their presentations, and we will take questions thereafter. But you can send your questions anytime through the Q&A box at the bottom, okay? So send those through and I'll be like vetting them and getting them ready. And also please definitely share with us through the chat box on the right hand side, uh, introduce yourselves and where you're joining from. We always like to see, you know, who is there. And uh, um, actually, Thomas, if you could just put that on a large screen, then and make sure you unmute yourself, then you're ready to go. I can, might be able to do this for you. There you go. Or not. There we go. Is it okay now? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Okay, good. Uh, so, <clears throat> good afternoon again. And uh, the first presentation uh, is from from uh, about renewable desalination. And I give you just a very quick overview of what Aquapower is doing. Uh, Aquapower is a developer, investor, operator, and owner of power and desalination plants. Uh, we have about 35, now almost 40 assets, more than 22 gigawatts of power, uh, more than 3.5 million cubic meters of water, which will grow in the next two years to more than 5 million cubic meters of water. Uh, water means desalination, seawater desalination, and we have investments of more than $30 billion in, in this kind of projects. So we are, we are positioned in both in conventional power generation, in renewable energy, as well as in desalination. So this shows you quickly the, the share of desalination. We have <clears throat> uh, a majority of reverse osmosis desalination, but also uh, ma ma major projects with MED and MSF desalination, which is the thermal desalination. On the renewable side, we have roughly 1,360 megawatt of CSP and almost one gigawatt of, uh, of PV. And also this one is growing almost on a, on a monthly basis. So this, uh, this slide I want to show you because it is very significant to see what the, uh, to renewable desalination, because one of the major uh, prerequisites to make it happen is that the, the, the cost of solar is coming down. And here you see uh, a snapshot of the last uh, eight years 
where the price uh, from CSP uh, went down from as high as uh, 35 cents uh, in US cents in 2011 to the last uh, big projects in Dubai where the the, uh, the cost, the tariff was 7.3 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is of course a significant contribution to make uh, a renewable desalination uh, uh, affordable and, and, and realistic. So let's talk about the subject. Um, first of all, we start with desalination. You will see here the geography of desalination, which shows that in the Middle East is a major capacity uh, uh, positions and concentrated in the particular in the GCC states and this is seawater desalination. There's also a large capacity in the United States but here's also a lot of brackish water desalination. So the real hub of seawater desalination is uh, in the Middle East and particularly in the uh, GCC countries. When, when we look now at the solar map uh, you will notice that uh, coincidentally the same countries which have a water scarcity and, and that's why they have large desalination capacities, uh, they also have uh, a high DNI uh, radiation. So this fits very well that uh, the same countries uh, with the water need, uh, with, the, uh, with the high DNI, uh, they are very well positioned uh, to look at this solar desalination. So here you see the map uh, of the Middle East. And what we notice here is that the, the highly populated cities are also on the coast. So we have now ful fulfilled three major conditions. So solar irradiation is there. Uh, the, the, the customer is, on the, is basically on the sea, on the coast. And the water, the water demand is growing in a very high, very high speed. <clears throat> so here, um, so looking at combinations. Um, to look at uh, renewable desalination, today we focus mainly on solar, but of course in renewable there is uh, uh, there are several options, uh, particularly uh, wind and geothermal and biomass, and there's, uh, I'm sure there's more options you can think of, and Jorge will, uh, will go also deeper in his presentation in the subject, so I'll give you a high-level snapshot. Uh, and so we basically have two, two ways of combining it, either with heat or with electricity, and we are looking today uh, at the solar side of the renewable desalination. Uh, here is a, is a chart which shows uh, capacity versus uh, maturity of technologies. And we are, uh, here in the Middle East, we're looking particularly at larger capacities. Obviously, there's many combinations in the, in the smaller capacity segment. Uh, but if you look high maturity and uh, high, high capacity, we're looking at solar uh, CSP combined with either MED or or combined with uh, reverse osmosis, same thing, either you produce the, the steam or you produce the electricity with the CSP. And uh, that's one of our focus uh, as well. <clears throat> In desalination, we have basically three, uh, three major commercially available technologies. Um, it, it started many, many decades ago with multi-stage flash and MED, the thermal desalination which was basically co coupled with power plants and, and produced water in cogeneration mode. Uh, the, the, it was very stable and very reliable desalination, but you can see on the data that the, the big disadvantage, it needs a huge amount of thermal energy to desalinate water, uh, which was available in the power plants and particularly in the Middle East, the fuel was almost free. Uh, this has changed dramatically and that's why uh, fuel is not free anymore. Electricity prices have increased dramatically and that's why the membrane technology has gained a lot of space, a lot of growth, uh, particularly in the last uh, <clears throat> area in the Middle East. In the rest of the world, it's already dominated by reverse osmosis. And you can see that we have only an electricity demand of nowadays less than four kilowatt hours per cubic meter, electric, and no thermal requirement. So that makes this the, the, the superior technology for desalination today. And all the project standard nowadays, uh, we had only, I think, six tenders in the Middle East uh, only this year with, with mega plants of reverse osmosis, all of them were RO. And there might be one or two in the, in, in, in the next three years from thermal desalination, but uh, the world will see a dominance of uh, more than 80% uh, worldwide capacity of uh, reverse osmosis. So here that shows uh, the investment in the last uh, years 
uh, and you can see that the SWRO means seawater reverse osmosis that uh, uh, this has this is continued to grow. Uh, there was a, a situation with uh, in 2015 and before where it was not clear where the, where, where the, the way will go, but a lot of projects have been retendered and the, the way is now clear. And the next slides will also show uh, in terms of capacity that over the last uh, over the last years uh, there was a significant growth of the membrane technology. So this is one of uh, the focus we have, um, combining renewables with reverse osmosis, but also there will be cases uh, to combine renewables with multi-effect distillation, which is the more, more effective uh, thermal process. So here is in terms of capacity, we can see a steady growth of uh, desalination plant capacities. The target is the 1 million cubic meter per day plant, which is almost reached. Uh, we just had uh, a big submission last week in Alta Vila in Abu Dhabi, which was a uh, 910,000 cubic meter per day plant. Uh, so we're almost there in the 1 million uh, standalone RO plant. And uh, uh, with this uh, increase of capacity, uh, <clears throat> the costs also came down. This is the second prerequisite. Not only solar cost must be low, also water, water cost must be low, particularly energy consumption and capex, uh, which are the, the main factors in the, in the water cost. And by growing capacity and more efficient equipment, we, are, we have considerably reduced the energy consumption, which is shown here. Uh, seawater reverse osmosis started in the old days uh, with more than 10 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. It went then down when, when energy recovery devices were introduced to recover energy from the pressurized brine stream, the concentrate stream, which goes back to the sea. Uh, then it went down and uh, the, the standard RO plants in the world, they are now in the range of three to 3.5 uh, kilowatt hours per cubic meter in in seawaters with less salt. Maybe in Singapore it could be even lower than that. And we see the future. There is uh, different technologies on the horizon, which also uh, like membrane distillation for water osmosis in the near in the near horizon, which also will be covered in the second presentation. And in the far horizon, in the in the near future, we are talking about monolayer, molecular layer graphene membranes. And then we are going down to almost 1.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And this is basically very close to the theoretical limit, uh, thermodynamic limit, what can be, what can be done. It's around for, for seawater here, it's around 1.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. It's a significant success to go down from 10 to 1.5. And we are looking forward to, to see that. And that will be another, another um, accelerator for uh, renewable desalination to bring the energy consumption down uh, of, the, of the RO plant which is today the largest component in the water tariff. So here we have the three examples uh, of uh, future, uh, near-term near future technologies. Uh, all of them already pilot tested uh, and uh, Jorge will give more details uh, on, on that one. Uh, that shows uh, how the water price uh, came down in the last years. Uh, we are now, just to, uh, the, the, the chart is not, uh, it's 2015. I can tell you now, and it was published last week, the water price in Abu Dhabi for a large reverse osmosis plant in the Arabian Gulf, which is the highest salinity, uh, was around 50 cents per US cents per, per cubic meter, which is, uh, it was actually 49 point something. So it's a, it's a world record uh, in terms of lowest water price from, from a seawater reverse osmosis plant. And at the same time, it was a world record in lowest energy consumption. Uh, for a seawater reverse osmosis plant. So you see this, uh, after 15, it still went down to 0.5. We will update this chart in the future. So now moving to the renewable side, uh, there's basically two technologies which we can look at, the photovoltaic, which uh, provides electricity. And here we have uh, three areas circled, which, uh, which uh, the, the main panels are uh, coming from. We have the, the poly and monocrystalline technologies, and we have the fin film technologies and uh, different types of fin film with different materials. And this is where the, the roadmap shows us uh, where we are in the efficiency scale. And we expect um, multi-junction technologies, bifacial technologies, which uh, may further increase 
uh, the efficiencies. And also, uh, that's what we need, uh, the, the lower cost for, for power from BV. And in the Middle East, we have reached now uh, something below two and three US cent per kilowatt hour as a reference value for PV, for larger plants. <clears throat> so on the concentrated solar power side, I think most of you will probably know these three ma ma main technologies with uh, solar towers and, and parabolic draft, the, the number one in terms of capacity followed by solar towers. We just, uh, under, we just uh, uh, executing a project in Dubai which has a 700 megawatt CSP capacity plus 250 megawatt PV on top of it. And the 700 uh, megawatt CSP comprises a tower of 100 megawatt and 600 megawatt of parabolic draft. And it's the largest single site uh, CSP plant in the world with, I believe, 4,000 hectares. And so there's also a, a good progress going on with 7.3 cents per kilowatt hour. It's for sure a, a, a big milestone. It's a, it's a quantum step uh, in terms of pricing. And we expect that the prices will further go down in the next projects. <clears throat> so this is some um, general comparison, uh, pro and cons of uh, CSP uh, between the different technologies, which is not uh, the highlight today. But this is maybe important that we see from the Sunshot uh, presentation that they have a goal of uh, 20, and if you look on the right side on the utility scale, they, had, they have uh, announced the goal of for 2020 of six cents. So we have already 6.3 and I think in Australia with different uh, solar resource, uh, they, are closer, they are closer to six already. Uh, and for 2030, three cents. Uh, we believe that uh, six cents can be reached uh, in 2020. And also we believe uh, after 2020, we can reach probably something like four cents. I don't know if it's three cents, but I think uh, we, are, we are positive that it can go down to four to five cents or maybe even three. So this is very important that we see that the cost of solar goes down. So now what we have to do is to bring also the energy consumption of the desalination plant down so that the solar plant becomes even smaller with less consumption. And now we have, uh, if you talk about com uh, combining solar and desalination, uh, we have basically uh, two techniques, the direct and the indirect. And here, this is one example where we combine a CSP with a multi-effect distillation where the steam, the exhaust steam from the steam turbine is used and can, op can be optimized for this purpose and you also have a net generation of, of electricity. In the second example, uh, here we use a reverse osmosis technology which needs only electricity. And so the, the CSP plant can be fully optimized for power generation and uh, connected to an aerobe plant. It can be co-located where it can be in different locations. Uh, it's basically connected by a, by, by a cable. Uh, <clears throat> and also the the CSP plant has a, has a storage, and with the storage, we can manage uh, any fluctuations, uh, in, 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 in any weather conditions to have a continuous uh, uh, production of the seawater or plant. But also on the desalination side, we can use uh, water tanks uh, as buffer tanks to, to ensure a continuous supply of, of uh, product water. Uh, here, that's, uh, that's a, another way of combining it uh, to produce uh, steam with the CSP. And from the steam turbine, you directly drive a high pressure pump of the uh, reverse osmosis system. And this has uh, also other advantages that you can preheat the seawater. And this is a way to directly combine with uh, steam without having electricity, without having high, high voltage motors, uh, how, how you use directly a steam turbine uh, to drive the, the pump. So that's three, three methods. Uh, and now we're moving to the PV side. Obviously, uh, the, the PV uh, with some storage integrated can, can, dri can drive the high pressure, uh, the pump of the RO. In this scenario, we need to be careful that uh, the, the RO needs to be redesigned with smaller units, which doesn't take so much power when you start up the motors, um, uh, so that you have the, 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 peak, the peak load uh, is, is controlled in a way that the PV can handle it or the storage. And so the question is now how to get 24 hours uh, water supply. Uh, one way of, of looking at that would be that you over-design the PV plant three times the, 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 the megawatts you need. And so basically when you produce this capacity, let's say 30 megawatts, you need 10 megawatts for the aero plant on the day, but you produce 30 megawatts 
So if you have a grid available, you, you dispatch the 20 megawatts into the grid on the day, where usually uh, off-takers are happy to receive extra power on the day. Uh, and then during the night, uh, you're getting this 20 megawatts back, and so you can spread this 30 megawatts uh, across the 24 hours. And that would be one way of looking at it to, to get a 24-hour water supply. And this is basically a future. Uh, we are looking also at developing complete cities where with, uh, like for example, there is a city which will be developed in Saudi Arabia, which should be completely supplied by renewable energy. And this in order to, and, and also from seawater desalination. So in order to do that, we need to look at different types of renewable energy. We need to look at different types of storage, uh, also water, water storage, even the wastewater has to, has to play a role. Uh, to, to reduce the cost for seawater desalination. And so basically this is a concept we are looking at uh, to, to have a complete supply of a city with renewable energy and uh, with, solar, with solar desalination. And that basically brings me to the conclusions. So water and energy are inextricably linked, especially seawater uh, desalination plays a vital role in the GCC. Uh, GCC is very much dependent on seawater desalination and it's continuously to grow. And a sustainable and resilient water supply is, is extremely important here in the region. Uh, the technologies uh, for solar and desalination are available in a commercial scale, and there's no reason why that cannot be uh, <coughs> deployed. It's very important to reduce the energy consumption of the desalination because that makes the capex of the solar plant uh, lower, and the overall water price will be lower. And so that's, that's one of the focus areas of, uh, of reducing the, the energy consumption. And uh, the second point is that uh, the CSP system is a heat supply system and designed, uh, should, uh, this is important. Uh, if we combine directly CSP with desalination without producing electricity first, we can use uh, a CSP system, system which is designed for lower temperatures and for lower pressures, which, which uh, inevitably uh, results in lower cost of materials, and this would uh, reduce the CSP uh, power generation cost. So both less energy consumption on the diesel plus lower uh, stringent materials uh, for, for the CSP system, both will contribute to bring the water price, the resulting water tariff down. <clears throat> Uh, what is also important to know is contrary to the combined cycle plans, the CSP peak generation occurs in summer, which can be used. Um, and water can be stored more economically than today's uh, battery storages. So it's also to bring into the optimization equation the, the water storage. And other storage technologies are also available, especially if you are near mountains, uh, gravity storage, or also called rock storage, or hydrogen storage, which is a very fast growing area are emerging technologies to store the excess generation from PV or from wind plants. So what is really needed now as a next step is to, to bring a demonstration plant on the way in the GCC to demonstrate and to, to path the way and accelerate the deployment of large scale projects. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Thomas. It was a very interesting presentation. And uh, we have a few questions, but we'll take it thereafter. So if you can stop sharing your screen, and we'll give also the, the screen to Jorge now. Just go to the top and, and, and press stop sharing. Thank you, Belen. Let's see how this works. Yeah, you're ready now. You just have to put it on. And just, just a, a reminder for everybody. Uh, that you can send your questions through the Q&A box and we will take them after Jorge is done. Uh, both questions for Thomas and for Jorge. There you go, we can see it perfectly already, Jorge. Good, so, good. So let's, let's start first thanking, thanking Thomas for, for his presentation. I think he addressed perfectly well the, the subject of today. Uh, in Navengoas, you know, uh, um, we are a, a, a company specialized in renewable energies and in desalination as well. So I think we have a vision of this topic. And I'd like to start my presentation with a thought, okay? Uh, Thomas addressed the issue whether renewable should be applied directly or indirectly 
to uh, desalination technologies. And I would like to, to start thinking about the efficiency when we are transforming uh, energy from uh, 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 thermal to mechanical, mechanical to electric. In every stra stage that we transform energy, we have losses, okay? The, the second uh, thought that I would like to fix also is that those losses in the end for us are residual energy, for example, waste heat. So where do we see the future of the salination technologies combined with renewables? Is with those technologies that will allow the use of those energy losses from other processes, okay? We see that now uh, renewable energy generation is getting to a very mature stage and desalination is still have to, to do that way uh, a little bit more. So better desalination focus on the use of those energy losses from other processes and try to avoid energy transformation. So if that uh, loss energy is in the form of heat, try to think of technologies on desalination that will focus on using that heat directly rather than transforming it to electricity and, and after applying to a motor or whatsoever. So, and we will see later on why the numbers doesn't match if we do it uh, uh, the other way around, okay? Just also to frame a little bit what the state of uh, 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 desalination plants run by, by uh, renewable sources, uh, I think Thomas already uh, mentioned it, but only 1% of the global desalination capacity are powered by, by renewable sources. So that uh, give us a hint on uh, where we are, how mature, uh, let's say this combined application of renewable and desalination is so far. 40%, 43% of those uh, uh, plants are based on solar photovoltaic, 27% on solar thermal, 20% on wind energy, and 10% in hybrid renewable energy sources, okay? Let's go uh, to next presentation. Uh, sorry, next slide. Uh, Thomas already mentioned the uh, uh, dominating technology commercially today is reverse osmosis. It's the most used desalination technology worldwide. It has a market share of around 60%. I saw that uh, Aqua's portfolio perfectly matches the uh, uh, desalination market as it is today. They were around 40% on thermal and 60% on, on RO, and that is precisely the actual state of uh, the desalination market so far. And why this uh, happened? Well, this happens in, and you can see on the, on the graph on the right-hand side of the, the slide since the late mm, 90s of last century that the power consumption of river osmosis really supposed a breakthrough in the market and thermal technologies could not compete with it. And from that moment is when reverse osmosis started to domain uh, the market, okay? Moving to next slide. On the cost of desalination and based uh, uh, more precisely on reverse osmosis, around 44% of the cost of desalinated water is associated to the power consumption of this technology. And this has CO2 emission associated around three kilos of CO2 per cubic meter. Okay, this is based on conventional power generation and considering a, a power tariff of around seven cents of dollar per kilowatt hour, okay? And if we go to the detail of where that consumption happens, 85% of it happens precisely at the reverse osmosis stage, okay? Thomas mentioned that actual consumptions in uh, uh, plants at commercial operation are around three, 3.5 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. If we only had to uh, overpass or overcome the uh, osmotic pressure between uh, seawater and, and, and permeate and all the water was converted to to, to desalinated water, the uh, theoretical power consumption should be around one kilowatt hour per cubic meter, where at present we are at three, 3.5 that uh, he will mention, okay? So what's happening now in the market? We see that 
uh, there is a trend to try to find alternative technologies to our own. We see and we, we present here the case of Siemens. Uh, uh, they did some research in the uh, Singapore Water Hub. They claim to come up with a technology based on nanofiltration plus electrolysis, okay, uh, achieving power consumption of around 1.5 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. So the desalination market, the technologies are moving on this trend of trying to optimize the power consumption of desalination. Uh, still, all those alternative technologies or processes to conventional river osmosis uh, are not mature enough, but there are trends in the market and technologies are moving on that direction. Beside that, we see that renewable market is really achieving a, a power tariff which is uh, uh, really amazing. We see, and, and here is a, a news of the latest uh, tariffs awarded with PV panels of tariffs around 2.3 uh, cents of dollar per kilowatt hour. What happens when we combine desalination with this uh, uh, well, sorry. Uh, in this other slide, we, we also see the trends of the of the tariffs. Most of the renewable sources have achieved uh, uh, tariff of power around below uh, 10 cents uh, of dollar per kilowatt hour. Latest tariffs on thermal solar. I think Thomas also mentioned 7.3 cents of dollar per kilowatt hour. Okay, and um, where does this take us when? we combine these tariffs with the uh, uh, actual situation of desalination with river osmosis. Well, the share of the power cost in the total uh, water cost, if we were using all this solar power, would come down only to 21% uh, from the 44% that we mentioned with zero uh, CO2 emissions associated uh, to the share of the, of the water cost. So we can get savings of around 30% in, in the cost of desalinated water at present using a uh, power tariff that uh, certain renewable sources are providing already in the market. So it's a, I think it's a, it's a remarkable event that it must be mentioned, okay? This is a, a tree uh, very much alike to the one <coughs> that uh, Thomas presented we try instead of mentioning whether it came from solar, it came from wind or whatever, we thought that we better split this tree on renewable sources that produce heat. It might well come from waste to energy sources, from thermal solar, or those uh, renewable uh, power sources that uh, produce electricity uh, directly or and indirectly. It could be wind, it could be PV, or it could be thermal solar or waste to energy as well. If we focus on the use of heat, uh, and Thomas uh, already also presented, sorry for mentioning you so, so much, Thomas, but you already presented the most conventional thermal technologies available in the market. There is a question mark here, and we'll see later on in a, in a slide. Are these technology ideal or suited to be combined directly with uh, uh, the heat coming from thermal? We'll see later on, but the answer is no. We need to develop new technologies that make use of the residual heat. Otherwise, it is better to put that heat through, uh, through a turbine and, and, and get power out of that uh, uh, steam uh, and then put that power into a river osmosis as we will see later on. Promising or emerging technologies that promise that they will make use of those residual heats in order to allow desalination will be technologies like forward osmosis or membrane distillation. If we, fo if we focus on the other side of the, of the chart of the tree, okay, we see that if we focus on making use of electricity coming from renewables, it might well come from the grid or direct use. If we focus on direct use, it could will be river osmosis. We've seen that there is still uh, good room to improve river osmosis on its efficiency from its theoretical uh, uh, minimum to the actual uh, consumption. 
the membrane manufacturers basically uh, uh, must uh, uh, come to the market with new membrane development that will allow to have uh, uh, lower consumptions. We know that in the membrane is where the, most of the power consumption happens, or it could be by using direct current technologies like electrodialysis or reverse electrodialysis. If we go to an indirect use, make use of the electricity directly from the grid, then we are separating a little bit uh, the, the case of uh, desalination and, and, and the generation of the power through renewables. And then I guess that the topics to discuss are more related to uh, infrastructure planning or government planning on how to equilibrate the demand of power from desalination combined with the use of renewable powers uh, in the in the power system of an area of our country. Okay. As I said, if we focus on heat, uh, if you do a calculation, and um, it was mentioned previously that MSF MED consumes around 80 kilowatt hours of thermal per cubic meter, it is much better that you put all that steam into a turbine, you generate power, and then you desalinate it through a river osmosis. In the uh, graph on the left side of the, of the screen, you will see that by doing that in the blue line, you get much more water than if you, if you use that steam directly into a thermal desalination technology. Um, this is when we use uh, a steam, which is rich, and it can produce power. Okay, something different would be if we had a technology, as I said, that we could make use of the exhaust steam from the turbine, which is normally around 80, 70 Celsius and uh, also below one bar in, in pressure. Okay, so new technologies that could make use of the heat. We have forward osmosis, basically. The, the uh, uh, principle of this technology is to attract the water from the sea uh, through uh, uh, osmosis membrane. But to do that without the use of power, we have to have a more uh, salinity solution on the other side of the membrane. So we need a solute that will attract the water. So the water will try to dilute that more salty solution that salty solution has to use what we call osmotic agents that after can be easily separated. So we separate the extracted water from the sea uh, from the solute. There are several developments using different osmotic agents Consider carbon dioxide plus uh, ammonia recu recovered through uh, low heat, uh, low grade heat also more salty sodium chloride solution, organic molecules, uh, mixtures of uh, sugars, fructose, for example, or also using nanoparticles or magnetized particles that are separated through electromagnetic fields. But in the end, is uh, withdrawing water from the sea through a more salty solution by using a osmotic uh, uh, membrane, a semi-permeable membrane, okay? This is a case of Trevi systems, so there are already uh, uh, companies in the market offering this solution. As you can see on the left uh, hand side of the slide, basically they have a draw solution with their uh, patented osmotic agent. We withdraw the water from the sea, sorry, and, and we extract it. Then we have a mixture of water extracted from the sea together with the draw solution, and then they have to separate it through heat. They recover the draw solution. They have also uh, heat exchanges to recover some heat of, of there, and they have the product water that after it is filtered. This uh, technology requires approximately 13, 14 kilowatt hours per cubic uh, meter of, uh, of heat, but they claim that this heat is around 70 Celsius, so we can uh, 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 describe it as low grade heat. And, and, and they claim also then that uh, the power uh, consumption from the electrical part is only 0.5 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. Okay. 
Going to other new emerging technologies, membrane distillation also make use of uh, heat. In this case, we present the case of a plant that we had in, in Master in, in Gantut, uh, open it there, precisely to concentrate the brine coming from river osmosis. So we managed to increase the recovery of that desalination plant for around 38% of recovery rate in the ROS stage to a, seven, a rate of 70% by using residual heat through membrane distillation. The heat required here was a very low grade uh, temperature heat, 40 Celsius, but the thermal consumption, if you see, is huge. It's around 80 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. The good thing of this is that that heat would be otherwise waste heat, okay? Obviously, we could also uh, PV collectors for uh, providing the energy needs of, uh, in, in terms of electricity of, of this plant, okay? Focusing on the uh, um, electricity part of the, of the tree that I presented, I'd like to bring also a new concept, is membrane technologies now also promise, membrane technologies uh, used for, normally for desalination, also promise to bring a new source of energy, what we call blue energy. So by using the different in uh, salt gradient between different solutions, in theory, we can produce blue energy. This is the case of pressure retarded osmosis technologies or reversal electrodialysis as well. Okay, moving to uh, next slide, we see here the process of pressure retarded osmosis. This is a uh, diagram we, we took from a Stackcraft in, in Norway. They install a, a pilot plant. They were claiming to pursue a power production of around 0 0.3 kilowatt hour of electricity or of electricity per uh, one cubic meter of seawater when it is combined with, with one cubic meter of fresh water. This can be used obviously in Norway where there are plenty of fresh water in the fjords. And although this is what it was claimed, an energy uh, uh, production of around 0 0.3 kilowatt hour per cubic meter when we put uh, seawater in contact with fresh water through um, uh, a, a semi-permeable membrane, uh, we must say that the Stackcraft stopped uh, using this pilot plan. The results are still not to be brought to uh, commercial operation. On the right hand side, what we see here is that the use of uh, forward osmosis, as the case of Trevi, what we can do also is dilute the solution uh, of uh, uh, salt water, the concentration of salt in, in, in sea water, before going to our river osmosis plan and also getting some pressurization system. This, this can be used by using also uh, water from uh, tertiary treatment from wastewater treatment plants and at the same time we get the benefit of diluting the wastewater uh, uh, discharge, okay? More uh, technologies, reverse electrodialysis, this uh, technology use uh, direct current. This is uh, what we see here is a skin of a research program uh, we were uh, involved. Basically we were separating uh, divalent uh, salt uh, from the seawater, previously diluted with uh, wastewater or river water. And after, uh, after having uh, 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 lower the uh, concentration of the, of the seawater, uh, we were putting that diluted seawater in a river osmosis uh, stage. Advantages of, uh, of doing this uh, that can be perfectly combined with the PV generation is that also the brine was diluted by being mixed with the uh, wastewater uh, discharges, for example, and that we could get uh, energy consumptions below 1.5 kilowatt hour per cubic meter versus the, the three uh, kilowatt hour per cubic meters that we mentioned uh, before. Now on, on the indirect uh, uh, use, uh, we've seen that there are also trends in the, in the government to compensate the power consumption 
uh, associated to river osmosis desalination, the dominating technology in the market nowadays. Uh, we put here some uh, news. Uh, the, uh, the first one is in Morocco, in Takla, a uh, seawater desalination plant that is being promoted by the Ministry of Agriculture of Morocco. And at the same time, in the uh, infrastructure, it is requested that the power generated or sorry, the power used by this desalination plant shall be compensated by the use of windmills, uh, which is uh, very competitive in the area where this desalination plant is going to be. It is also the case of Australia. Australia had a very ambitious desalination plant, uh, plant in, in, in the first decade of uh, this century. Um, they uh, focused very much on compensating the uh, power used by this desalination plant with renewable uh, uh, power sources. Okay. Finally, to finish with my presentation, I would also um, like to mention uh, something that sometimes I skip to some people is that the brine coming from desalination can be a niche of uh, CO2. Up to 135 grams per cubic meter of brine of CO2 can be, can be, can be captured in, in the brine. Also, brine is very rich on, on magnesium, and there are some researches on trying to uh, get the magnesium hydroxide, magnesium, magnes uh, magnesium hydroxide, sorry, from the brine. And um, magnesium hydroxide can also be a uh, mineral to uh, uh, for the sequestration of carbon dioxide. Okay, so there are other opportunities in desalination also to try to compensate the CO2 emissions associated to its power consumption. Um, this is what I wanted to present today. Uh, Belen, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to give our view on desalination and renewable uh, power technologies. No, thank you very much, actually, Jorge, to the both of you, because you've done an excellent job of bringing the spotlight into this important topic. I think and I hope that we will see a lot more renewable desalination in the future. A um, couple of questions we have here, is kind of late anyway, so do send questions if you have any further, but let's start with this. Uh, one of the questions here is, which of the C three CSP technologies will be the most adapted to desalination in, in, your long, in, in the long term, in your view? So who wants to answer that? I think it was you, Thomas, that have the three uh, the Fresnel and the parabolic trough. Just unmute yourself and you can answer. Okay, working now. Okay, it's a general question. Uh, we will see uh, all three of them. Why? Because uh, different requirements. If we go for electricity generation, 24 hours base load, the, the parabolic trough in the solar tower technology is a very well positioned for that. Uh, which technology will be selected depends on the on the meteorological conditions. In in dusty areas uh, where the so the <coughs> attenuation is is bad, atmospheric attenuation is bad. You will look for parabolic trough. And if you have a very clear sky, like in the mountains in Morocco, in Nevada, or in uh, South Africa, you can use uh, also very well the solar towers. So it's, uh, it's not really a desalination question. It's, it's a question of the circumstances at the location in the country, uh, that the so-called DMY, uh, which will give you, after optimization of the, of the processes, which gives you the better, uh, the better result uh, for, power, for power generation. And uh, the three technologies, yeah. Fresnel, I think, is for, for, for smaller systems. Uh, it could be direct steam uh, to, the, to the turbine. It, it's, I, I don't see any particular favorite. I see it, it's, it's very dependent on the project conditions, on the, on the project specification, what you want to achieve. So all three will be available and maybe more in the future. In smaller, sure. smaller plants, even parabolic dish. No one size fits all, right? Every project needs to be considered on its own. That's what I'm getting from this. Okay. 
Second question, another question here from Christian Conan. It says, uh, if reverse osmosis is the water desalination technology and only needs no heat, which potential do you expect for CSP compared to PV? I can, I'm already oh, unmuted, yeah. so I can answer. Um, yes, reverse osmosis doesn't need heat. This is the current technology. Uh, and we can produce uh, the electricity with the PV, that's fine. But we need a battery because water production in the Middle East is always 24-7. So if you combine the tariff of PV with the, with the battery storage and you compare with the CSP with molten salt, you will see that currently today, uh, CSP is ahead of the game. And that's why in Dubai we built a 700 megawatt CSP with molten storage and not the, not the 700 megawatt PV plant. So uh, <clears throat> this again depends on the situation um, CSP cost will still drop, battery price will still drop. I think both will have a niche. Uh, CSP can be also hybridized. Uh, there's many presentations with uh, gas turbines, with, uh, with geothermal, with uh, biomass. So there's, again, it, it is the job of a developer or a, a contractor to develop the most optimized solution for a project. And it depends what feedstock do you have, what is the electricity cost, what is the, the cost of the feedstock, what is the meteorological uh, conditions. So I don't think we should try to put uh, only black and white picture here. It is a very complex situation. And the, the, the future technologies that as we have seen in the second presentation, uh, like uh, forward osmosis and membrane distillation, which have much less power consumption, electric power consumption than RO, they need heat, but it is a heat which can easily be generated by low cost CSP systems or like Fresnel or, or even the, the one in Oman, the, the class point system. Um, there are several systems around which produce a low cost heat. And this is, a, this is a quality of steam which is not suitable for power generation. So uh, we will see at the moment are always very clearly dominating, but as I said in a, in a previous publication that uh, it depends, the future of desalination depends very much of the which form of energy is available and how energy uh, is, uh, how power is generated in the future. And that's, uh, we also look at nuclear desalination in Saudi Arabia. So we will have the full spectrum and everything will, every system will have its niche. Would you like to add anything, Jorge? No, I think, uh, um, uh, Regarding the, the use of reverse osmosis as a dominating technology nowadays, uh, I mean, the, I think that in the end, it frames the issue whether we should disconnect the, let's say, two topics of today and having a good equilibrated electrical uh, system with the renewable sources plus conventional, etc., and getting the, the desalination uh, technologies separated, getting benefited, obviously from the mix of the power tariff coming from desalination plus conventional, or if we should co couple them uh, together. Okay, uh, as Thomas uh, said, obviously with the state of uh, reverse osmosis nowadays, uh, it uses electricity. It's a question of putting pressure through a, a membrane. So uh, heat, you either use it to generate that electricity or it will be very difficult that you make use of that, that heat uh, other way. But there are combinations of technology as we've seen in, in my presentation where you can uh, use semi-permeable membranes as uh, for water osmosis, subtract the water from the sea and after uh, separate the draw solution from the extracted water through residual heat. So the uh, concept of the technology is basically also using semi-permeable uh, membranes and reverse osmosis uh, to the east, but it's, it's the, precisely the, the opposite uh, process. We need to have better membrane development for, for these technologies at, at present. Unfortunately, reverse osmosis is what it is and we need electricity so far. Okay. Um, there's a question here that's quite interesting, actually. It says, uh, how would it affect the desalination water cost if the desalination were to be reduced to six to eight hours a day? So in other words, not needing storage. How does this affect the price? Who wants to take it? 
just unmute yourself. You can leave your microphones unmuted now if you want. I, I think already we already answered. I mean, the, 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 the power uh, cost component in the water travel was around 44%. It would be reduced if we if we if we come down from a power tally of seven cents per kilowatt hour to 2.7 to around 21 percent of of the total water cost and that would suppose an overall reduction in the water cost of around uh, 30 percent this is applying directly that uh, power tally generated from uh, renewable okay obviously the uh, amortization concept of the asset, the, of the desalination plant infrastructure, it, it has to be used only one third of the time that it was supposed to be, will take uh, longer. Understand that the rest of the time the desalination plant should be using obviously power from the grid, uh, whatever the tariff is, uh, just to amortize it uh, much faster. Otherwise that the amortization component of the of the water tariff uh, would increase by by basically sixty uh, percent, and that wouldn't make sense. Okay. Okay, that was it. Uh, we have to say goodbye, but just have a question for you. Where do you speak? Do you expect to see the most growth in demand for renewable desalination in the future? I, we know the Middle East is definitely an area, but where else do you expect this particular market to boom? over the next few years. And I'd like to hear from the two of you and then we'll say goodbye. Do you wanna go first, Jorge? Okay. Uh, all areas in the world with the potential of uh, having a, a cheap power tariff uh, and, and having water scarcity, I, I think Thomas show a, a, a map uh, worldwide with the, the water scarcity for example, Chile. Chile has a huge potential of uh, solar power generation and also has a water scarcity. So that would be also a perfect match of combining uh, renewable power with desalination technologies. Obviously, Middle East, we've seen also uh, show uh, news of a project in Morocco, an irrigation project that uses desalination water and its production uh, is uh, compensated with windmills. It is also the case of Australia. I mean, the, the, the compensation of uh, the power use of desalination with renewable sources is not new. Australia did it uh, uh, 10 years ago. And we seen that that trend is being followed by many other countries where they have a huge potential of renewable and they have a water scarcity. So all those areas obviously will follow that trend. I'm sure of that. Thank you, and Thomas? Yes, uh, I think nothing much to add. Uh, these are the countries. Uh, what I see is that the lowest water cost can probably be produced in Chile for one of the reasons mentioned, uh, the, the very high DNI. But also what we need to know is the, the seawater there has very low salinity. So this, this both, both will contribute to uh, uh, to the uh, to the lower water cost. Uh, a similar scenario is possible in South Africa. Um, uh, all these all these countries, Chile, South Africa, they have this water scarcity. They have a high DNI and they have a low salinity, and the water is also colder, which will support uh, new technologies like forward osmosis. Forward osmosis has a high efficiency at colder water, which is contrary to the RO, which has a high efficiency at a higher temperature. So we will see. In, in Chile and uh, hopefully in South Africa, uh, solar combination with uh, future FO and uh, and of course uh, still today uh, reverse osmosis or, or thermal technologies. And uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, we still have in, in some regions of Saudi Arabia, we have a high DNI in the Northwest, for example. And also at this area, there's no gas net, there is no electricity grid uh, or very little, or if it's there, it's not stable. Uh, for high loads, so we will see there uh, plants, uh, and also uh, first of all it will be larger scale, and second it's also by legislation because of the new fuel policy of Saudi Arabia, which which will not allow any oil-fired power plants, which will focus on gas and renewables and a little bit of nuclear. We will see that certainly, and also low carbon credits, uh, carbon credits, all these things come into the game, 
and we will see also in Saudi Arabia and in the Middle East uh, uh, more plans in the future. Well, this is great news, and I, I hope you know that this is the case. So thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much, Jorge, for, for sharing your know-how with us. And thank you very much for everybody who is in the audience. See you in the next uh, webinar. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.